So I assume certain things that I think a lot of scientists don't assume or philosophers don't assume, but they debate them forever. And while they're debating them, animals are dying left and right and being tortured. So I assume that animals are feeling beings, that they have feelings and that they have a point of view and they care about what happens to them. Um, I believe also that animals have a moral code and no right from wrong. The book that they have here called Wild Justice, it actually just came out a week or two ago, that um, they have desires and intentions, they want to be treated fairly, and they actually expect to be treated fairly, and so if they're not treated fairly, they suffer. You know, animals don't only suffer because they're tortured. They suffer when their needs and their desires aren't met. All mammals have the same structures in a brain, part of the brain called the limbic system. So mammals share these structures. Mammals share the same neurochemicals that are important in processing emotions. So for example, if you train a rat to expect to play with another rat, they show an increase in dopamine, and so do humans. So these arguments from analogy that scientists and philosophers call them are extremely strong and valid ones, okay? So when people say that they don't know, for example, if dogs or cows have emotions, I say, I'm glad I'm not your dog. I mean, could you imagine living with somebody who doesn't, who, who questions that? I don't think they're serious about it, but they do. And then I also ask scientists who do really horrible things to animals, would you do it to your dog? Because that brings the argument home. And almost everyone says, no. I'll tell you a story in a bit about my friend Bill and his dog, Reno. Um, you know, so I always really ask them, why won't you do to animals, what you, what, why won't you do to your companion dog or cat what you do to animals in a lab? Now, one of the things that we all know is how complex and how frustrating and ambiguous our relationships with other animals are, okay? So one of the things I like, I like pondering our relationship with animals because it tells us a lot about who we are. That's not the only reason. It goes both ways. By trying to understand other animals, we can come to an understanding not only of who they are, not what they are, but who we are, not what we are. We don't we don't talk about humans as its and what's. And so I like to say that with regard to a lot of what your interests are, is who we eat is a moral act, not what we eat. Every time people say, well, what would you like for dinner? And it's an animal dinner, I always say, no, you mean who will you eat for dinner? Let's cut the shit. <laughs> Sorry, kids. But let's just cut right through the chase. You're eating a who, not a what. People don't like that. Did you ever notice that? And then I have a lot of friends, and I'm sure you do too, and they'll say, well, I understand that animals are sentient beings, and they, have, they know right from wrong, and they have deep feelings, but I love my steak. I'm sure you hear that all the time. So I'm going to play around with some of that stuff. And um, like I said, I know that you're the converted, but, but I do think we can change um, other people's hearts and minds by being compassionate with them too. I don't think in-your-face activism really does very much. I mean, we all get angry. Sometimes we do things that we wish we didn't do or say things we didn't say, but, but I think that really the way to do it is to be kind, and I'll come back to that at the end. And I wrote a paper recently called Good Welfare Isn't Good Enough, because good welfare allows you to blind cats and starve rats and shoot dogs with bullets and shock animals until they die. That's all legal within the um, confines, if you will, of the Federal Animal Welfare Act. And of course, Proposition 2 passed here, but you know there's not a lot of federal or state humane slaughter types of regulations. Okay, so good isn't good enough. That, I mean, that's kind of a motivator for me. That good isn't good enough. Um, good isn't good enough because the laws protecting animals just suck. They're horrible. They don't really protect animals, they protect the scientists. So we better remember that right now. Okay, because who makes the laws? The last time I looked, I didn't see a mouse writing any part of the Animal Welfare Act. But, for example, we know mice now feel empathy. In a hardcore, horrible scientific study, um, it was shown that mice feel empathy and feel the pain for, of other mice. 
that has not even dribbled into any kind of discussion now on updating the Animal Welfare Act in America. Surprisingly, I, I spend a lot of time in Europe. Surprisingly, the EU is much more advanced than we are in terms of just a lot of animal legislation. But we're not really hallucinating about animal emotions or moral behavior. There's a principle that Charles Darwin put forth called evolutionary continuity. And it's a big word, but really what it argues is that the differences among animals are differences in degree rather than differences in kind. And if you want to boil that down more, it's the differences are shades of gray, not black and white. And that's a very well accepted principle in evolutionary biology. And one of the things you can do with that is sort of boil it all down to say, if we have something, then other animals have something. We have a heart that pumps blood, and other animals have an organ that we call a heart that pumps blood, but it doesn't look like ours. But we still call it a heart because functionally it pumps blood. They have stomachs that digest food and kidneys that process body wastes, but they don't necessarily look like ours, but we still call them stomachs and kidneys. They also have emotions. And so if we have joy or grief, a good biologist would have to conclude that other animals have their own sorts of joy and grief. So there's dog joy, there's elephant joy, there's dog grief, there's elephant grief, there's mouse joy, there's mouse grief, there's rhesus monkey embarrassment. You could just do the whole litany. But the important thing to remember is when people say, oh, but animal emotions aren't like ours, so therefore they don't have them, there's no reason why they should be like ours. In fact, my joy is probably not the same as everyone's joy in this room, but it would be wrong to say that I have it and you don't, or vice versa. We studied coyotes and wolves in the wild. A wolf pack could not exist if the animals didn't demand some sense of equity. Because the composition of the group and the integrity, the cohesiveness of the group, depends on them being fair to one another. And we discovered in the wild, I'm saying in the wild because a lot of captive work is definitely tainted by captivity, by the conditions of captivity, that coyotes who cheat are usually excluded from their group. And coyotes who leave their group die early. So there's a component of fitness, as we call it in biology, to being fair. So the bottom line is that fairer and nicer people, or nicer, well, like people, I'd like to think that, but animals are reproductively more fit. I'm not saying that animals are always and only just and fair. What I'm saying is that the competition paradigm, the survival of the fittest paradigm, the nature red and tooth and claw paradigm is not the only show in town. And in natural selection and evolution, there's always something that controls evolution. So you don't see animals get to a certain size. It's called stabilizing selection, okay? You, you may have animals, or say in humans, who are really tall. You may have people who are very angry or very mellow. But the animals at the ends of the normal distribution are usually not adapted to their environment. Okay? So that's, that's basically what I'm saying. So, of course animals fight one another and they compete with one another. But for too long, that's been the dominant paradigm. And that's actually been an argument that's been used to justify keeping animals in cages and in zoos and using them in rodeos and in slaughterhouses. Is that, well, animals can be cruel to one another and we're an animal. Why can't we be cruel? Okay? There's a change now in the paradigm because we're realizing that we can't explain all animal behavior by looking at animals as being red and tooth and claw.